So I promised Ashley that I wouldn't use the joke that this may be short so we can get all get off to the uh, get to the Alabama game tonight. And so when I got here, you know, that was mentioned a couple of times or whatever, and I was thinking tonight was singing night with a short Devo at the end. So this may indeed be a short Devo, but it's not because of the Alabama game. I can guarantee you that. But So tonight, uh, I kind of want to share with you just some things that I've been uh, studying and looking at and things I've tried to apply to my own life. And one of those th- things that often drives how we react to this world and to things is fear and anxiety. And it just troubles so many people. And as uh, a teacher and a coach, uh, fear is something that oftentimes drives us. And that can be a positive and a negative, depending on how we look at it. I've often heard the analogy, and I didn't bring it uh, tonight um, as like a prop, I guess. But if I had a just a two-by-four, just a beam, and I laid it up here on the stage, and I asked one of these guys or some of you if you would walk across it. I think I would get some volunteers. Uh, even if I said, hey, I'll give you five bucks if you just walk across that, and it's just right there. Well, nobody would probably think much of it, and they would just easily walk across the beam. Now, if I put the beam up in the skylight, and I said, now I want you to walk across the same exact beam, the same exact one that was standing up here, sitting up here, how many would do it? And then if I offered you $100, you know, $1,000, would you get several hundred feet above us and walk across the beam? I don't know that many people um, would take that challenge. Uh, but it's it would just be a simple task, a simple task that, all of us probably could do if, if we just if it was on the ground. But the moment the circumstances change, our willingness to do something changes. There's an ancient proverb that says that fear does not prevent death, it prevents life. I've had moments in my life that I've let fear and things I can't control prevent me from doing what God has had in store for me. You know, Probably simply just being up here tonight speaking. You know, that's something that normally I would say, ah, that's not for me, or I don't feel comfortable doing that. And so I feel like over the past couple of years, my life has changed in a lot of ways when I simply tried to see the fear differently. Because it's not like uh, the fear is not there, it's just how I can perceive that fear. Uh, an example, another example of this, in, in 2017, Alex Honnold stunned the world when he became the first person ever to climb Freerider. And I don't know if any of you have been to Yosemite before, but this is a 3,000-foot ascent up the Yosemite National Park's legendary El Capitan. And he, he did this entirely with no ropes, so there was no safety uh, Basically, it was perfection or death. That was kind of the options. He was either going to climb to the top or he was going to die. I kind of, you know, I've never been here, so I kind of did a little bit of research on it. And it said 31 people have died trying to climb up uh, this uh, side of the mountain, which obviously would put me out immediately. Like, that just doesn't, you know... Uh, I've been to the Grand Canyon before. They talk about how at least one die every year from getting too close. So, you know, things like that I try to avoid. So I don't know. This guy felt like he could do it, and obviously he was successful. Uh, There's a documentary out called Free Solo that kind of documents this climb. But afterwards, Honnold was asked several questions about how he was able to do this free climb Um, when, again, his options were death or perfectly climb up it. So he says, people talk about trying to suppress your fear, but I try to look at it in a different way. I try to expand my comfort zone by practicing moves over and over again. I work through the fear until it's just not scary anymore. 
The fear that prompted Honnold to put in extensive amounts of focus work before he attempted the monumental free solo. And I guess this related to me a lot with, uh, as far as being a basketball coach and seeing uh, in my experiences, you know, oftentimes, whether it be my own personal teams, but uh, with the basketball tournament going on now that hopefully most people are aware of, but some teams play afraid to mess up or they fear losing. And, you know, there takes a lot of training, a lot of practice that goes into preparing for games so that that fear is eliminated. Because I found that if you focus on the fear or the negative, then that's probably going to be what happens. Like if you're afraid of losing, you're probably going to lose. And I oftentimes told uh, my players this year that we were going to play to win, that the losing, we're not going to play not to lose, that we were either going to win or lose, but we had played to win. And, you know, John Wooden has always said that great teams make mistakes. Like there's mistakes are going to be made because you're trying to give it your very, very best effort. And by giving your very best effort, you will make mistakes along the way. But if you're afraid that you're going to make mistakes, it'll prevent you from being in a position that God could, could use uh, for your life. We have so much to offer the world that fear and anxiety disconnects us from our abilities. So we could have the greatest ability ever, just like Honnold. He could climb and do all those things. But if we let fear take us away from our abilities, then we can't use those, whether it be in our personal lives or in our spiritual lives and when God needs to be glorified in things that we can do. Tony had talked a lot this morning about the different abilities that were given within the church. And the church, and as a church, we need to be able to use those abilities. Uh, you know, we all have things that we have that, uh, you know, that the uh, church can use, our community can use, and that other Christians can uh, use your abilities and to help them. <clears throat> What we should really fear is that we will miss the opportunities that fear offers. Fear is a natural reaction. It has positive benefits that can keep us safe, of course. Um, if you wake up at 3 in the morning, smoke alarm's going off, you smell smoke, you don't just go back to bed. Like That fear helps you save your family. It can cause you to react. It can... You know, you, you can't just not have fear in your life. It's how we perceive that fear. Facing our fears gives us a confidence that when bad things happen, you will find a way to handle them. So a few decades ago in Arizona, some scientists wanted to uh, do an experiment where they built Biosphere 2. This was a huge steel and glass enclosure, and uh, the air within the enclosure was purified. They had clean water, nutrient-rich soil, lots of natural light. Everything that uh, was needed for to life inside the biosphere was there. It seemed like conditions were perfect. And it was very successful in a lot of ways in, in a, a desert climate where they don't have hardly any of those things, it did provide that. But it had some huge failures as well. Over and over, they began to see that when trees grew to a certain height, they would just fall over. And, you know, no matter what they tried, no matter what they did, trees would only grow so tall, and then they would just fall over. So the scientists began to try to figure out why this was happening. Finally, they realized that the biosphere lacked a key element necessary for the health of the trees, and that was the wind. In a natural environment, trees are buffeted by the wind, and they respond to the pressure. By doing this, this agitation allows them to grow stronger bark, and they bury their roots, roots deeper into the soil 
so that it increases their stability. So as they go through conflict with the wind, it actually makes them stronger. It makes them to the point where they can continue to grow and be more successful. But without the wind, it was very difficult for the trees to be strong enough to withstand. Uh, there's also something we talked about with our basketball this, this year is uh, when, when it comes to fire. You know, if it's simple, a ca- simple candle can be blown out. But what often uh, leads to when there's large fires happening is everything that's in, it, in its way is just fuel. And it's part of life is you can let little things like wind uh, affect you. It can cause you to to fail or to be afraid. But if you uh, are strong enough, then you will actually become stronger every time you face adversity. We often waste a lot of our time and energy trying to stay in our comfort zone. We try to build our own type of biosphere, and we just want to stay in that. And we feel safe, but we're not growing stronger from that. We usually have four emotional reactions to fear. And we see a lot of these examples in the Bible, uh, being from Jonah to the disciples, Moses. There always seemed to be this idea of fear that wanted to prevent them from doing things. But these reactions are to panic. Uh, Oftentimes we freeze. We want to run away or possibly just bury it and not really realize how bad it's affecting us. And and the burying it might actually be the worst for us. All of these distract us, though, from the solution. And that is, and that prevents us from using our fear productively. And again, you know, I think when we're young, we're taught that you shouldn't be afraid, or if you're afraid, you're embarrassed. Um, I think uh, we can use fear in a positive way. And I think God has given us, you know, the instincts of fear. Um, You know, like I said from earlier, if if things are bad happening or things are uh, possibly going to affect us negatively, we should be afraid of those. Uh, But there are other ways that fear and anxiety and worry will affect us. So tonight I would like to just quickly offer maybe some causes of our fear and where most of the time maybe our fear comes from, and then maybe a cure for when we do face fear. Uh, In some of the research I've been doing and some of the uh, thoughts on fear is the the main cause of that is from our attachment. Uh, We need to own and control things. Uh, We want to know the outcome. We want to be able to... uh, predict what's happening, know what's happening. That way we can prevent ourselves from being upset or all that. We hold on to ideas that we have about ourselves. Uh, We hold on to our material possessions, our standard of living that we enjoy, and things that we think define us of who we are. Like if we uh, we're afraid of losing that standing within our community. Even some of our relationships that we want to be one thing, and simply they're just another. What we really need to do to keep that fear from controlling our lives is to detach from it. So if we want to cure ourselves from that negative attachment, we have to detach. Uh, One kind of exercise we can oftentimes do with this is think about the things that we're attached to. You you could even get out a, a, a pad and pen and just make a list. Like, what are things that maybe I'm too attached to in my life? And, and probably on the list, none of the things are going to be negative or wrong. It's just how do we view those things? If we made an audit of those attachments, um, would it be uh, some on the list uh, of things that you're afraid to lose? Uh, Some of those external things like our cars, our house, our jobs, our looks. And then we have internal things like our reputation, whether that be at school, at work, in our community. Uh, Our status, 
our sense of belonging? Where do we fit in? How do we stack up to our friends, our neighbors, coworkers? What you know? Um, how do people perceive us? We can get so wrapped up in these things being taken away instead of appreciating and have gratitude for us having those things and what those things really are. Because we can't control anything or truly own anything. If we cling to these temporary things, they get, they're given power over us. And they're able to control us because we are clinging to them and we're so attached. They become a source of our pain and our fear in our lives. I'd like to quickly uh, look at Philippians chapter 3, verse 2, to kind of give an example of, of Paul when he had probably every right to cling to things because the world, he felt like he had these things that I don't guess he realized yet that were temporary. But in Philippians 3, verse 2, he says, watch out for the dogs, watch out for the evildoers, watch out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision, the ones who worship by the Spirit of God, and we boast in Christ Jesus, and do not put confidence in the flesh. Although I have reasons to have that confidence in the flesh. If anyone else thinks he has grounds for confidence in the flesh, I have more. So, you know, Paul's... when. He's writing to them saying, if y'all think y'all have confidence, let me tell you about myself. He said he was circumcised on the eighth day. He's of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, regarding the law, a Pharisee, regarding zeal, persecuting the church, regarding the righteousness that is in the law, blameless. But everything that was a gain to me, I have considered to be a loss because of Christ. More than that, I also consider everything to be a loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Because of him, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I consider them as dung so that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own from the law, but one that is through faith. In Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. My goal is to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. Paul is one of those guys, as we look as at being at Mars Hill and teaching world history, we look at how events affect the future. And Paul, who was Saul at the time, had so much probably to be afraid of, to give up. You know, he was doing what he thought uh, was of God, that he was doing God's work. He was persecuting Christians. But once Saul experienced Christ, he couldn't turn back and do anything else. I felt like he, and within a couple of days, had totally changed his life and he probably obviously would face way more fear in his new life than if he had just stayed where he was at. I mean, he was given power and authority. He had all the titles. He had the family name. He had everything he needed, and he was willing to give it all up for a much more difficult time. But when we accept the temporary nature of things in our lives, we can feel gratitude for the good fortune of getting to borrow them. And I think if we see them as things we get to borrow, that, you know, God has let us enjoy here on earth, but they're temporary. They're not things that will last forever. 2 Corinthians 4, 17 and 18 says, For our momentary light affliction is producing for us an absolutely incomparable eternal weight of glory. So we do not focus on what is seen, but what is unseen. For what is seen is only temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. I think oftentimes those things unseen, you know, those are the things the devil, that he does not want us to see. He does not want us to see what putting our fears aside and following God's will will do. He, 
the devil wants us to focus on things we can see and touch. And if we can keep, if he can keep our mind on those things, then the heavenly things that are the most important thing that we could possibly have, we'll ignore. It's been said before that our fears are more numerous than our dangers. And we suffer more in our imagination than in our reality. We become best-selling fiction writers and start asking, what will happen if? And we start having all these scenarios play out. And every single moment, everything that happens, we uh, invent things uh, that most likely will never happen. But all those scenarios that we come up with, that kind of imprisons us. If we're in our own little bubble and we're saying, well, if we do this or if I try to do this, if I step out on faith, then all of these bad things could happen. And that keeps us uh, stuck where we are, that there's no place to grow. Uh, it, it's like the trees that kept falling. They, didn't, they weren't strong enough. They weren't able to grow, and they weren't looking to get better through adversity. So again, we should never judge the moment that we're faced with a fear. Focus on what we can actually control. Test the moment to see what opportunities might come from it. You know, there's nothing wrong with saying, you know, I feel afraid right now, which is much better than saying I am afraid. I think if we, we say I am sad or I am afraid, that puts ownership and that put, says that we're attached to that emotion. But we should be honest and say, well, I feel afraid right now, but what can come of this? How can God be glorified through this? It's not possible to control all external events, but if I can control my mind and what I'm thinking about that event, then there's no need to want to control other things. Just like we talked about earlier, we uh, dream up scenarios, we think about scenarios that may not ever happen. I do want to just end with uh, a couple verses and some encouragement. Uh, Philippians 4, 6, and 7 says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And then 2 Timothy 1.7 again, that was read for us earlier. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. And you know, the Bible also says that perfect love casts out all fear. And so we know that the fear and that letting it take over us would only be uh, something that's not from God. God is not going to give us um, the mindset to be afraid. And it's about putting that uh, our thoughts to Christ and giving our cares to God. It's often said that when the fear of staying the same outweighs the fear of change, that is when we will finally change. And so I don't want people here tonight or in my own personal life to just be okay with who you are if that's not what God has in store for you. And that sometimes if we just have that idea of it, it's not good to be where we're at, that uh, sometimes the thought of if we can't change uh, for the good, uh, you know, it might be scarier than the change that we don't want to make. If there is a change that you need to make, if fear, anxiety is preventing you from doing uh, the will of God, we ask that you come seek the prayers of the church. If you need to put on Christ in baptism, we're here to help you do that as well. So please come now as we stand and sing.